hate you. Hello, and welcome to Everyone Hates You, a podcast with me, Michelle Shaughnessy, where we talk about failures and rejections. So listen, I've had a few episodes released so far, three. I've heard your feedback, and by your feedback, I mean um, the nine people that are currently listening to this. Uh, And you guys want to hear more about failures, more about rejections, and less about how good things are going for my guests. So I'm very excited to have this guest in studio. I have Laura Smith here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you are absolutely killing it right now. I love to see it. Love to hear about it. Let's get to that at the end. <laughs> so the listeners, they want to hear more about how terrible things have gone and are going for people, you know? Yeah, correct. I mean, I, I, everyone wants to relate to that. Yeah. You know, nobody yeah. wants to hear us chat for an hour about how great everyone else is doing. No. So, I mean, I definitely have a lot of failures and a lot of rejections. Um, one of the first ones off the top of my head is when I first released my episodes on YouTube, I spelt my own name wrong and that's still up there on episode one forever. No, yeah. So, you know, I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. I'm going to leave it there. A few people noticed and yeah. I'm just like, fuck it. It's a failure. Yeah. I'm going to leave it there and own it. That is that is how you got to go through life exactly yeah yeah Yeah, exactly so we had talked a lot. Thank you so much for coming on. You're I really very appreciate it. This was one of those guests that I was like, she doesn't really know me that well. Is she going to be like, I don't want to fucking do your podcast. But, um, you know, comedians are such desperate little pick me little fuckers, aren't we? That it's like, I guess yes, we are. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I guess we are. Like, I had I had Nabil in studio last week and he was like, nobody ever asked me to do podcasts. Thank you so much. I, I think like, oh. we can make an assumption about where we think someone else is at. That's true. And then actually, we're not, we all just want. I want to be asked. And for the most part, a lot of people that I've asked has said yes. A few mm. people have been like, absolutely. And then they've just never replied when it came to dates. But you yeah. were very like on the ball. We booked it right away. And I appreciate it. Yes, that. you're very welcome. Um, so you are getting a lot of success right now. But I assume there were some failures and rejections before you got to where you are today. Well, yeah. I mean, are we talking comedies? Oh, no. It can be anything. anything. I can just think of so many cringy things of like, especially in your teens and 20s, you're just meant to be a shithead. And and the problem is we carry that with us, don't we? Like, right? It's it's like, that is what's filling up the flipping therapist. All this weird, stupid shit. It's like, when stuff happens to us when we're young, people are like, nobody will remember that in 20 years. And we're like, okay, but we remember. And that's the most important part. I know. You know, know. those things haunt us forever. It's so stupid, isn't it? Well, yeah, I can think of like jobs I've gone for or I oh, just oh, I, I, mean, I, know, I know this podcast and it needs to be really specific and I knew that this was going to be asked but <laughs> I'm just, I suppose I've just got better at healing from them which is pathetic but um, oh yeah I mean when uh, I mean I was I was a single mum do you know what I mean I never okay. thought that I'd be a single mum you know that, that even carries with you you know you just kind of go Oh, hang on a minute. I feel like that was a, that's a lot of thing that's fueled me in the sense of like being on the back foot. Like I went to mm-hmm. a school where a lot of the girls left school and just had my base. And I never thought that I'd be not, I never thought I'd be that guy. And then I was, and I think I'd got into my like, well, that's the bracket I'm in. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay. So you were like, this is just how my life is. Yeah. A little bit. Like it took me a while to, I mean, obviously I loved my daughter and it was all good. And, but it was that sort of thing of like, ah, oh, you know, you're you're in the housing list and you're like mm-hmm. claiming benefits and you you all of a sudden you're going like how how did I get here do you, do you know what I mean yeah. I think that there's a sort of re, like rewriting that you have to do for yourself to get out of that as mm-hmm. well like it is definitely those mentalities so yeah I think that was the first one and I didn't actually know how much it affected me either is there was there a part of you that was hesitant to kind of like talk about that now that you're not in that situation well yeah but it took me like. It took me like 10 years. So I had to just, just a turn 20 sort of thing, like just at the end of my teens. And I, I kind of, I didn't really, I think basically I dated so terribly for 10 years. Do, do you see what I mean? Because yeah. in my head, like, and I always say like, if I knew I was going to get married in my early 30s and meet my husband in my early 30s, I would have just enjoyed the dating. But I think there was, I, I put pressure on this dating as though like, I, I just, I was an idiot when I was dating because it was all a bit like, what I really wanted was to be like with someone and like make a family unit. Mm-hmm. But equally, I was so scared of like what uh, openly asking for that, that a lot of me was like, yeah, it's fine. Like I was always like, red flag, red flag, go away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When I was dating, like, yeah, I've got a daughter, but I'm doing this and I'm working. And I've got this and I'm, you know, so I don't need anything. So I think so you very guys, kept up like that facade that like everything's great. I'm fine on yeah. my own. And these guys were just, just like, somebody for some man. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And these guys were like, well, what do you want from me here? And then I was like, uh, you know, I, I just was a moron dating for like 10 years. So I think that was a big thing for me, a big, a big failure. You know, it's, it's stupid, isn't it? That, that. 
that it, I, I'm almost, as a woman in her 40s now, I'm quite embarrassed how much stock I put in men's opinions of me throughout my 20s. I still struggle with that. Really? I really do. And I don't know why. I, I really? don't know if it comes from like kind of growing up as like not being popular and not having boyfriends when I was younger yeah. that I felt like when I did finally start dating, I would just... Anybody that asked me, I'd be like, okay. I know. Like, I'd be like, somebody likes me. Like, I have to go out with them and this has to work. And, you know, and it was more like holding on to relationships because I was like, well, I can't, I can't be single. I like, know. I remember when I turned 25 many years ago, I had just broke up with like a guy that I thought I was going to be with forever. Yeah. And I remember feeling like such a failure going home for Christmas and being like, I can't believe I'm 25 yeah. and single. Yeah. Like, what is wrong? It's so dumb. And I was speaking to another queen actually the other day. <gasps> And she was saying she can vividly remember crying in a restaurant because uh, she was 27 and nearly single going, who's going to want to marry a 27 year old? You know, like now you're yeah. like, what is it? It's like when you've, you've just started at 27, but there was just this weird, I don't know, because I don't know, man, the pressure in, it's laughable, but you can't tell a woman in her 20s now. No. You couldn't tell her because she's -uh. just, it, this, this kind of outsourcing our power is insane. I remember, I think it was Sarah Cox or someone said, Sarah Cox said years ago, if a 19 year old girl knew how powerful she was, the whole world would be different. But that you don't, you just mm -hmm. like, like, and you look back at these pictures of you as a younger person, you think, you fucking moron, what I would do with that waistline now and that face and that skin. Yeah, you know I mean? it's, it's like, like looking at photos when you're like, oh, that's when I thought I was really fat oh and I God. didn't want to go out or I hid myself. I know. I would kill to look like that. I know. You know. It's so it's so ridiculous, and I and I hate how confident actually I'm in my forties, and I think, I, I you know I'm like my size at the moment, all, all those sorts of things. They don't have any bearing on how I feel about myself. When did that confidence come? I don't know. I think well, this is about L's though. We don't want to talk about the wins, do we? But I think after ten years of dating mm -hmm. and hitting thirty and thinking. Actually, I'm the fucking problem here. I'm, I'm, I, I, I used to sabotage stuff. Okay. I'd, I'd act weird. I'd act weird. I'd act sort of weird and neurotic holding on to men. And then they'd kind of keep a distance and go, oh, see, I'm unlovable. Like, even yeah. though I fucking did it. I, I was the weird. I was like, well, I'm not the cool girl. I can't do casual sex. I thought I could. I can't do it. Oh my God, I, me neither. Like, I, I get so attached to people. I know. And then it's like, I'll try to hold on so much when they very clearly are like, this is over. I'm yeah. like, okay, there <laughs> it is, you know? And then you, go, then the years go by and you're like, oh, I didn't even like you. I, I just know. didn't like that you didn't like no, me. No, 100%. I, and, and, and that that was like, you know, I see friends that date now and they're single friends and they go, mm, and they go, oh, I'm not really sure about this. And they kind of get rid of guys because they're not sure about things. My only measure of how successful things were going is whether he liked me i never yeah. stopped to think like you know like, like jurassic park spent so long wondering if we yeah. could never stop to think we should <laughs> i spent so long wanting them to like me i never stopped for one fucking second when my friend would be like would you like him and i'm like oh yeah uh, yeah i guess well what do you like about him i probably couldn't come up with much uh, uh like do, do you know it's not pathetic it is but i think we all went through that like, like my very best friend in the world when we were in our 20s there was just a random guy that we knew and she was like that's the one that's the one i'm gonna go for and he didn't like her back and i was like that's so sad like like what did you like about him and she was like i just thought that he would like me like i looked at him and was like oh i can get that loser yeah, and then yeah, i couldn't yeah. get that loser yeah and it like spiraled her and i was like i've been there yeah you know where you're like oh i'll just pick that guy because he's a fucking idiot <laughs> <laughs> and he'll accept me. And then when they're like, no, you're crazy. You're like, what? <laughs> but, Excuse me? But I'm in a better back bracket than you. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got a stupid joke at the moment. But like, you know where I go, sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm dieting because of the caliber of men that are now chatting me up. I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Like, you know, you toothless, dusty fuck. What? But um, the confidence on some of these men. Oh, I know. But then you don't pick friends like that. That's what the moment I had to get to. You don't pick friends like you pick romantic partners. Do you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't go... Look, they're really not into me. <laughs> you know, we don't have the same sense of humor and they're not really a vibe and actually they gross me out, but we're going for brunch on you know Sunday. What? I do do that. And you know, my, I've done that since I've moved here because I just don't have a lot of friends here. Yeah. So basically anybody that was like, let's hang out, I was like, okay, we're friends. Yeah, and yeah, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes like I sit there and I'm like, we have nothing to talk about. Like it's just silence. I'm like, why, why am I here? But I'm just like, well, I don't, I don't have any. any do you, do you have uh, lots of siblings? No. no, I have. I'm a middle child, obviously. Okay, so I have an older sister and a younger sister. Okay, but, but we were never like our ages were far enough apart that we were never really like hang out close. Yeah, but I think there's something. I've got lots of sisters, and I genuinely wonder. And my mum used to say it about me, especially when I was in my teens. 
I expected that level of loyalty. Like I would go, I wouldn't approach people like, oh, you're going to be my friend. I, w I almost wanted sisterhood from them. I wanted like, I really do, I actually do quite, I still probably do nurse rejection that hard, mm -hmm. like even in French, because I'm like, oh, but, and I think that I've taken for granted a lot of my like, sisters can be pure cunts to each other. A hundred percent. And it doesn't matter. You're not going mm -hmm. anywhere. And I just didn't really understand that actually, I can't go out into the world and expect that from everyone else. I almost mm -hmm. want, especially when I went to uni at 18, that kind of like held on too tight. And these people were like, and I understood boundaries, boundaries, really healthy boundaries in friends and relationships as rejection. Like, yeah. well, no, I can't hang out every night. Like, what? But we're friends. We're, that, that's how pathetic. I, I think, I don't know if that impacts the psychology, having lots of sisters, maybe. I don't know. Oh, I feel like I need to get a therapist on this podcast. Yeah. I, like I have a lot of questions. Yeah. And I want to know, like, what those type of rejections, like, if that's what made me the mess that I am today. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because a lot of people... And I mean, I have had people come on and do talk about their failures and rejections, but they all talked about like how it made them a stronger person. And I'm not saying it didn't. I'm not saying it didn't. I just haven't fucking found that for me yet. I haven't had that come to Jesus moment where I'm like, oh, this made me the strong, independent woman that I am today because I still don't feel that way. You know, it's weird. isn't it? And, and what you also have then in a new country and not loads of people around mm -hmm. you and your whole sport is, is fuck loads of time to think. And actually, the more you look at something, the more it's there and you yeah. can just sit and, and actually when you get out your head and get in your body and go and do some shit, you're actually I've, I've had a lot of therapy, but that I, I, had, I went for hypnotherapy for a long time, which I liked a lot more than that sort of therapy of like, um, you know, oh, so my mum was like this, my father was like this, and I think actually that impacted me. You know, you could do that forever. You could go through your narrative forever, but actually hypnotherapy, and I did it once I got ill, I had breast cancer, so I was in such a neurotic state from mm -hmm. that that I kind of took hypnotherapy almost just to handle my neurosis. But you know when you're going something, <laughs> do you ever have something like where, I don't know, you might go for some help and they're like, no, no, we're going to talk about this. You're like, no, no, I just want you to give me some like um tools to deal with the anxiety. But it's like, well, no, we're going way back. Or I talk about something with my, he goes, yeah, but we were talking about why that affects you. And you're like, oh, okay. Uh, and then it was like, he, he really kind of took some blocks away from me that I didn't go there for and mm -hmm. didn't think was the thing. And actually, What's really nice about hypnotherapy, yeah, you talk about, you'll present what's going on that week, but he just broke down the structure of the brain, which is basically that fucking reptilian part of your brain at the back that learns to, oh, never go there again, smell smoke, you know, or mm. or, or the, these hurts where we're like evolutionary, evolutionary structured to nurse these hurts. If, you know, you wouldn't go, you know, these things... You, you keep that hurt. The body keeps a score. You keep that hurt so you don't go there again, but we're dickheads mm -hmm. that go there again. But we're no longer cavemen. We're no longer just fighting for our lives, but we still have that brain structure. But he was just basically saying, because that cup of stress, when that's full, you can't handle stuff. So your focus is keeping the other cup full. So it's you make sure you're having good interactions, good thoughts, good things. You know, these kind of, I mean, good is reductive, but you know what I mean? As in healthy, so that, that actually that cup is full. So... What I do is a fuckload of self care, and actually, when the more I take care of myself, the less I'm fucking bothered about the other things. Do well, you see you what I mean? Self care. <laughs> what do you? Because I I feel like I do a lot of self care, but I don't actually know that it counts as self care. What's your self care? Like Botox. And yeah. Like facials and like. But does that? How does that, that make you up? feel? It's a good question. It makes me feel. I don't know. That's a good question. It makes me, f I feel like when I look good, I feel good. Yeah, that, well, that's valid. But I'm also finding that I think I need to accept that I'm never going to feel like I look good enough. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then I was like, is that self-care or is it just, I mean, I'm not going to stop doing it, but no. I, I, I was hearing someone talk about recently how you can't just say like everything is self-care when it comes to like, oh, I got a massage, self-care. I got this, self-care. So I guess I was just curious like what your version of self-care was. Was it more internal? Well, yeah, in in a sense, in the sense, yeah, you know, no. uh, it, well, because that's it. I like shopping, but I wouldn't call that self care. That's kind of uh, that I would call that consumerism, and okay, it kind of leaves me kind of cold. But the things, I suppose, it's a sense of fulfillment. So I, I go, I see a cranio osteopath, which is a lot more a kind of in, in alignment. I've I've got a, a spiritual healer who I go to. That's a lot I of shin tie and stuff. I um. The hypnotherapy was really good. I know that w you've got a little dog. I've got a Maltese Pomeranian. You've got a pure Pomeranian. Um, but long, 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 long walks, w what that does afterwards. You know, so that uh, that awareness of like, like my dog got attacked once and was laid up for two weeks. <laughs> 
And so I couldn't go. And I, I had a really bad couple of weeks. And I, it was worried about the dog. And I actually realised, oh, no, I'm missing the hours walk in the morning, the hours walk in the evening. And then my hypnotherapist says to me, well, why don't you just go for a walk? <laughs> and I was like, oh, but is it that mum mode? I've got three kids now, like of like that mum mode of like anything that's for me or not, you know, I can walk the dog because I'm doing a purpose and I'm, it's almost like a domestic chore, isn't it? But that thought, oh, I could just walk. Like even smoking, it's someone says to me about smoking. I, I used to love smoking because so I could just go out for 10 minutes. No one wants anything. It's like it's, your peace. Yeah, self-destructive. That's what I liked about it too. I loved it. But someone was like, well, why don't you just go out for 10 minutes? And I, oh, you know, again, these, and it, so, so those moments that are just about like you kind of holding yourself and holding space for yourself, I suppose. And, you know, who doesn't love a fucking facial and who doesn't love injections in their face and they look up and they go, fuck yeah, it took a few yeah, years off. You know, love I, it. I love it. So your your face lit up. So that that is valid. But if then, so that's one side of it. You are taking time and you love it. And I love everything. I love getting my nails done. I love everything about the nail shop. Yeah, you have beautiful nails. Yeah, I need to go and sort me out. Okay. But all those sorts of things are nice. But if I was if I was then sort of shopping and getting my nails done and going, oh, her nails are better than mine, and do I look this? And, and I'm still in my head. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's when that's a separate thing. So going to get Botox, going to get facials, yes, is good for you. But if you're then in a mode of like I'm doing this for a, some invisible sense of being good enough, I think it's that it's, it's eradicating as much as we can. The external, like, I mean, we do it like I fucking love, like, another thing with my hypnotherapist, comedy. By definition, we want to go into rooms and make a hundred or two hundred or three hundred or sometimes a few thousand strangers laugh at us. By definition, what we do, we're pathetic pieces of shit that want oh, external validation. I know, that's And then so how do true. we fill the gap in between those times? And my brother was really good at saying to me, I worry about the gaps in between that. Had you of, thought about that before he said that? Because I'd never. I never thought about that until you just had the gaps in between. Yeah, and that's a big thing. We can't discount, and I've had to look at that, and, and I did that again with my hypnotherapist because he'd say, how's your week been? And I would reel off things. Like, I got this, like, it was that's all great. Okay. It was all business. It was all work. And he said, and at home and the family, and I almost was like, Ugh, because I'm sort of having a moment that I haven't had, you know, being a mum all my all my adult life, all these things. It took me a long time to get to this moment where I'm doing stuff for myself. So both with comedy and getting ill and taking care of myself. So I'm like, home life, ugh, don't, why are you bringing up that shit, that shit and drudgery, do you know what I mean? But it made me go, oh, I need to put into it. Yeah. And the more I put into it, guess what? It's fucking good. Do you, do you see what I mean? And actually taking those times... And, and that balance, but it's, you don't always get it right. But it's not balance of like, oh, I've done all their lunches and I've done all that, but actually putting into the home the good the good stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And so being conscious of that is quite a good thing, I suppose. But like, yeah, it, it, it all of it comes from getting it really fucking wrong. And we're so horrible to ourselves. And actually, I wouldn't be able to do this stuff on my own, I don't think. I need, I, I'm happy to acknowledge, I need a lot of things in place mm -hmm. to keep this. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so then we beat ourselves up because we're like, oh, well, I feel like this. Gah, why am I like this? I'm a fucking piece of shit. And then this is this horrible, it's like I always say, it's like, um, you know, when your washing machine doesn't drain properly, so mm -hmm. it's dirty water for spinning it around. Sometimes you need these things that are, you can put all the detergent you want in it and all the shopping and the brands or whatever you, I'm into, well, all the stuff I'm into. <laughs> I'm a fucking shopaholic. I'm a scrollaholic. I've got all these vices and food and all these things. But when it's like, actually, I need to clear the drain here and work out what's blocking stuff, you take those moments. And whether that's taking yourself away somewhere or and, and actually honouring yourself that you deserve that. That's a really, wait, okay, so <laughs> hypnotherapy. Yeah. <laughs> Are you out? Like, are you under? Like, are you under like a it's weird, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm scared of it for that because I'm worried that like, well, what are they going to do to me when I'm like, Sometimes I just fall asleep, but some were really crazy, almost like hallucinogenic, trippy, where you've done the kind of, like you've offloaded whatever and then we do the trance and, and being talked under. And and sometimes you're just, you know, like, oh, what's happening? And he's like, that's all fine. But sometimes you're in a kind of really weird half lucid half kind of hip hip um hip you know kind of hallucinogenic state where i'd walk down this staircase as part of the the kind of visualization and trance and you're going in in this relaxed state and and it was like i remember once where picture a door you can go in the door 
And it was like picturing a clock and you're trying to exist in the moments between the ticks of the clock. This kind of really deep stuff. And then there was this bit where there was room and there was a really dark room, almost like a broom covered there. And it's a grand house. This is all in the imaginings. And then went into another one. And there was another one that was really light and it had a microphone stand, funnily enough. So of I course. So it was very much, I felt very much my conscious ego was pulling me there, pulling me there. But this dark, really dark pull was towards this really dark door. And I thought, I don't want to go. I could feel, so it was this weird trippy tussle. Like it was And you like, remembered all this. I remembered it all and I was, and there was a very, it was, I can definitely say I was in between a state of having, like, like sometimes you can be with dreaming where you can almost dictate what's going on or try and be in a dream and you're half conscious of having a will, a will at play in it. But something kept pulling me to this door, but I remember thinking, I don't want to go. Very like something when you're really stoned or mushrooms, or you know, like, and then I did. And I went in this really dark place and it didn't seem to have a floor. And then when I went through it, I, this is one that really stood out. I've done it a lot of times, but the black all fell away and it was almost like I was at the savannah and it opened up into this really huge space. So that was a real breakthrough moment for me of like leaning towards the sort of darkness and things you fear to go through it a little bit. I feel like maybe I should try, because I'm not a fan of therapy. I've talked about that way too much on the oh, podcast. Have, yeah. I don't like it. Um, but maybe hypnotherapy is something that I should try. I think with a good hypnotherapist, I'll give you his number. It, okay. With a good one, I think what you achieve is that you're not navel gazing you're not going michelle why is michelle like this why is michelle like this it, it's more like of course human brains are structured like this let's let's just re it's a bit like let's just rewire that brain a little bit so yeah almost like let's deal with the problem head on and yeah. spending like months just talking about where the problem came from yeah because you could do that forever exactly that and that's what i found with therapy it was just like yeah talking about the same things over and over again it's like okay well when is this gonna feel better because it doesn't yeah and sometimes i can be in a real bad emotional state or psych uh, psychological state and actually I go mm, well you know what I've probably where I've maybe had events on or done I've probably had a couple of glass of wine every day mm -hmm. I haven't actually slept that well and I've got a deadline mm -hmm. so actually I'm, I'm not ah, you know th there's not a deepest underlying problem but we attach thoughts to our feelings so you can be fucked and your nervous system starts, and we play as comedians. You play your nervous system, spraying, but um, you play with your nervous system as a comedian, don't you? Because you're up high and adrenaline, and it, whether it's good or bad, you're playing with your fucking cortisol and adrenaline nonstop. So actually, you can be strung out and be like, "Oh, everyone hates me. Oh, I'm so foolish. Or I did this, and God, I embarrassed myself." And actually, I've learned to go when I might start do when I'm spiraling like that or having these thoughts. I go, "Ah, I'm not in it. Ah, oh, I need to." I need some rest or I, okay. I start clearing my diary. I go, I just, I just see that as a measure of if your car started making a funny noise, you, just, you go, Oh, hang on. Do, do you see what I mean? Like I just go, oh, I need to refill my tank. That, 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 that's how, that's how I maintain good mental health. Good for you. Do you know I what I mean? Like, it's strange because it's like those moments where, you know, those moments where you just w have to fall apart. Every yeah. time, sometimes we have to fall apart. I feel like sometimes I've, I learn to like those moments. Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to be home alone. I'm going to order a bunch of food. I'm going to yeah. cry all night. Like, yeah. this, is, this is great. Yeah, and I, I like it. And I like enjoy those. And some people think it's really weird. No, I think that's fucking brilliant. Sometimes I feel like it's good to just cry and feel self-hate yeah okay oh i, I love it i that indulge makes me feel in it. better because a oh, lot of I people think it. that it's like i'm like seriously mentally ill and I'm, i mean i definitely my mental health isn't 100 percent, but i like those moments sometimes yeah and also so i saw this thing the other day that said it's always like a post to post because we live on our phones but that good mental health is not about being happy good mental health is about being a pro having appropriate emotions mm -hmm. if your friend died you'd be in pieces mm -hmm. if you're working hard and you, you can barely meet the rent yeah you're fucking stressed and pissed off you're not meant to go i'm gonna put on my happy face do you know what I mean like you're meant to be straight you're allowed to have fucking emotions mm -hmm. i think that's what we're in like it's like people can't have emotions and so they scroll on their phone or like yeah have emotions F fucking yeah it's shit you, you're in a country in a kind of fairly tough industry and you're like mm -hmm. I'd fucking curl up in a ball like happily and go yeah I'm doing this that's self care that I think feel better. Yeah. I love that like I love that because sometimes I'll be too open about it and someone will be like what are you doing tonight I'm like I'm just staying and cry and they're like oh my god <laughs> are you okay like I'll come by and I'm like no no this is what I want to do with yeah. my night you know <laughs> and people are like that's that's not it's not healthy I'm like 
feel like it kind of is. Well, I think that I just think that is. I remember saying I used to love a rom com and I'd cry. And yes. I'd, and I'd cry and think, when will Ryan Gosling love me that much? And then I got married and, you know, I have someone that loves me that much and I just want them to go out so I can watch a rom com and love cry. That. I love that. <laughs> I want to, yeah, just fucking, I love it. I love being, I love mad women. That's the other thing. I love mad women. All my sisters are mad. And I love the fact that I can vent to them like my. I'll phone a sister. Oh, no, I just want to run away. I fucking hate it. I just feel like I'm a shit mom. And then, you know, all that sort of thing. And the next day, my, my sister will phone me either one and go, you're all right, still a shit mom. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, they get that you were just going, nah, like that. It's insane. Like, ugly crying, hyperventilating about Love it. nothing. About the fucking school run. Love about it. the school run. I sent, we're talking about failures. I, I missed... My son is the youngest, and um, school clubs. All, I get all the parent mail. School clubs, and what else was another one? School clubs was one, and parents' evening. <laughs> missed it. Missed all you of just that. Forgot about <laughs> it. Didn't book at any of them. And then I thought I was being cute, and I was like, I, I, I hate myself. But I went. I put the subject matter to the email to the school. Bad mum alert. Because <laughs> I'm cute, guys. Just somehow <laughs> missed it in my email. Traffic. Mm. Any chance? Any clubs still have got any availability? And da, 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 and and then can we reorganise maybe next week for you know as if a busy mm-hmm. teacher wants to fucking make time for this dickhead? Anyway, just got this such a passive aggressive in my back. Appreciate everyone's busy, but there's no cl- clubs available. Hope you don't miss the next one. I hope you don't miss the next round to book for the next one. And you know when you want to go, <laughs> but I did it. I just went. Thanks. You know when you're like, Arr. you know when thanks means go fuck yourself. Absolutely. But I, yeah. So I was just like, it was really like, I thought I was being cute, bad mum alert, but they just were like, yeah, you're a fucking bad mum, basically. When you so when you had kids, hmm. did you like? Because I often wonder, like, I don't have kids, and I think about it from time to time, and I often wonder, did you know that there were going to be failures or times that you would fuck up as a mom, or were? Because I, I I know some people who have kids and are like, I'm going to be the best mom ever. Like mm. this is going to be perfect. This is. Were you under any of those delusions? Well, I think that um, I know I got low as a young mum and feeling the pressure. And even that, like, it infiltrated my parent in this sort of, I'm a single mum, but I'm going to sure as shit prove that I'm the best mum in the okay. world. And then actually I realised so much of my parent, because I think actually when you're telling off your kids, you're telling yourself off, you're like, you're not saying, why did you do that? You're going, why did you do the thing that maybe shows me up as a bad parent? In, mm. you, do you see what I mean? So your anger is actually, and stress is frustration, that you're trying to be a good mum, and any time they fall short, it's almost like narcissism re- as a reflection on you. Mm. And I definitely, as a young woman, kind of, uh, and I wanted so much to prove, and I think I was really hard on my eldest, and then obviously, then I, I fell in love, and I'm in my 30s now, so I'm going to be a really good mum now. And I remember saying to another of my sisters, who's who's pretty wise, but I said, you know, I just think... I think of, I, I can't really beat myself up at how many times I might have got it wrong with the oldest. And she went, yeah, and you're going to get it really wrong with these ones as well. And I was like, you're almost a bitch, but I was like, oh, right. and then those words now ring in my head because you think, yeah, you are going to get it wrong. You'll be good. You got, you've got to be just good enough because you are going to get it fucking wrong. And that's a lot. That's, that's why parenting is so fucking hard because we're all nursing our fucking, oh, my parents, blah, blah, blah narrative. So you're determined. They're just this clean slate, isn't they? I watched the Slice Stallone, Slice Stallone. Oh, oh I just watched you it too. You know when you talk about the clay? Yes. The clay. Yes, absolutely. And then you're just this wet clay and then if it's handled too heavily, those imprints shape who you are. Mm. And I thought, yeah, that's, you just want to make sure you're not hitting the clay too hard or, you know, you're just delicate, you know, you're shaping them and you're aware that they're this, I'm glad that you watched that doc because I, I'm obsessed with Slice Stallone. Oh yeah, he's I a celebrity am now. crush. Oh really? You can still get it. <laughs> um, I love Rocky, and I watched that movie a lot because yeah. I watched it when I was a kid, and it was just this such underdog story. Oh yeah. And so I remind myself of that all the time. But then when I was watching the doc, and I was like, huh. How old was Rocky supposed to be? And I looked it up, and I was like, I am so much older. Yeah. Than Rocky was. You know, so I put it in that kind of terms that I'm like, maybe this, I don't have an underdog story. Maybe this is just my life. But this part um, is like, fuck Wimbledon tennis stars that are 15. I don't get, give, right? me, give me the people, like, you know, Camomile Lawn. Apparently that's a, the woman who, that was her first novel and she wrote it at 70. And that is, I love that. Yeah. and there's, there's loads of people, that, that's what I mean. Like I, 
and I mean, uh, Kelly Beaton. Kelly Beaton was like so she didn't start comedy till she was she in her forties. Yeah, I love 40s. that. She loved the fact that she was debuting on Live at the Apollo in her fifties. I love you that. You know, I debuted in my forties. Okay, do you see what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like these these are invisible fucking time. T- and like even the whole doc is him packing up his life and going, well, I need to keep it moving, basically. But also hearing like the relationship with his father and how competitive his father was with him, <laughs> that was fucked up. Like I was oh. not prepared for that. Did you almost wish? Couldn't my parents just been a bit shittier? Can, right. <laughs> can I just been in care for some of it? So like you get the motivation to yeah, get yeah, out. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But it was like because there was a part in the documentary where he, he was talking about how after he wrote Rocky and the success, his dad's like, "I wrote a boxing movie. It's called <laughs> Sunny. I want to make it." Part of me was like, "What the fuck?" Like that made me be Fucked. like, "Okay, maybe my parents aren't as bad as yeah, thought, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, like, yeah." That's psychotic the, like, and have that throwing him of off the polo horse right Fuck. but part of me is like i wish i could get a hold of that script like i, I want to know <laughs> <laughs> you imagine if i read it i'm like this is the best movie ever like give daddy a chance but yeah that documentary really kind of put things into perspective for me in terms of like you know how he was with i mean i also do feel like it was a soft documentary he was a oh, producer so there was stuff so. they didn't talk about that i really w- would have liked to talk like about. what well i as mean a, as a fan you know more i feel like there was a, maybe, I don't even know how long ago, when it came out, there was like a Me Too story about him or something, uh, which he denied, but there was like audio tape of him. Do you remember that? Him no. getting like a blowjob in a bathroom when he was like, cut my balls, cut my balls. And oh, no, like one no, no. <laughs> But that kind of disappeared. <laughs> but I think sometimes when you're a big celebrity, that stuff can disappear. Well, they can, I wanted, yeah. I wanted them to talk about it. Yeah. You know? Like, I, I just wanted to know. I mean, uh, even like the fact that his son just died, I had to Google that. It was uh, Yeah, like, they didn't talk about that. Yeah. Which is, but they didn't talk about it. They yeah. also didn't really talk about Creed. And I know he has a weird, Sly Stallone has a weird beef with um, uh, the people who own the rights to the characters and stuff. Uh, so he wasn't in the most recent Creed movie. And not only yeah. was he not in it, but they didn't even acknowledge it. Like, they weren't yeah. like, oh, he's visiting his son, or this is why he wasn't here. So they just didn't really talk about that stuff. Well, it's a huge PR thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you've got to. I mean, Arnie was the same. It was so funny that Arnie. Have you watched Arnie? I haven't. Oh God! Maybe I mean, watch that tonight. that's even worse. I mean, okay. that's, that's a three part, but you know, it's very like. I mean, it's unbelievable. It is just unbelievable showboating. They gloss over stuff, even to the point of like, yeah, my father was a broken man coming back from war. Yeah, your father the Nazi. Like they were, <laughs> we know what side your father was fucking fighting for, bro. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's funny. Like, it's so, yeah, it's funny the whole PR thing, how glossy it is, the power. Mm-hmm. They're, they're powerful players, aren't they? And also, like, watching, I- I'm going to watch the Arnold one for sure. I love that kind of stuff. But yeah. also, even when Sly was talking about how he had the success of Rambo, the success of Rocky, and the things that came after weren't as successful yeah. and you know and he was really he really took that to heart yeah you know and it's it, it is refreshing to see like i know i said to you earlier i don't want this to be a positive podcast yeah. and i don't think i meant it as harsh as it <laughs> i just didn't want it to be all about listen to this podcast to be inspired because maybe you will be but i want there to be some weeks when you're not and that's okay yeah, too yeah, yeah, yeah. but i did find it a little inspiring where he felt like a failure when he has like millions and millions of dollars and had these two super successful franchises. Yeah. And until, you know, all the movies kind of between there and like The Expendables, he just wasn't happy with, you know? But have you watched the Robbie documentary? Is that no, but everyone's talking about it. So I'm on it as well. And, and, and <laughs> Sean Walsh posted about it today exactly what I was thinking. Because I was in it. I was like... It was it's real life. Take that and mm. all that sort of stuff. And I remember like everyone losing the plot when he left and all this sort of... And I remember in real time, the kind of tabloid hate for Robbie. But essentially what you're watching is a man in his underpants in a huge mansion with his beautiful wife and four children looking at videos of him smashing life, but feeling sad. That's really funny. That's and that's really basically funny. what it is. So you go, and then, and then we get back to then what the, f- unless it comes from within, what the fuck will be enough? You know, the, the, do you, you feel know, like that sometimes what, with your career? Well, you're, like I said, you're doing great right now. Yeah. You did Apollo. You went viral. You're going to go on tour. Yeah. Is there, do you appreciate it? Or are there still times when you're like, oh, well, I should be here or, you know, I should have got this five years ago or I should have, you no, know? No, no, no. Because I've, I, when, because basically, I don't know if you know, um, I was teaching for 10 years mm-hmm. and then I started comedy late. And then I handed in my notice at work. And then in the September, I didn't go back to teaching. I, I found a lump in my breast. So I literally was like, everything then everything was turned upside down. And I was going for comedy with that head. 
I was in comedy, like watch what everyone else and oh, and oh no, no, I want that. And it was so grr, I want, want, want and a plan. And there seems this trajectory that when you're signed as though you're going to do multiple week, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And, mm. it, and, and it's so like, uh, 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 and, it, and it, it didn't feel right to me, but it, 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 well, it had become this dream that I was chasing that was meant to be just a dream because I was like, enjoy the thing I'd always wished to do. It was like, oh, I want this, I want that, I want that. And then actually you get diagnosed with cancer and you go, I don't want anything. I don't want anything. There's nothing. I want to live. What the, I couldn't have named you one thing I wanted. I couldn't have worked out. I couldn't have told you one thing I wanted. I could not have told you one thing in this world I wanted. Everything just, the, the floor fell out from below, beneath me. Simple as that. And in this weird fucking parallel way, I needed it. I needed it. I needed to go, nothing matters. And actually, I really, the only thing, the only my way of getting through life, and I wish, I don't want anyone to get cancer to have to learn it. Mm. You've only got today. The minute you're like, uh, uh, I do my best work today. I do my self tapes, and I, I can watch te television programs, and all of a sudden they're saying dialogue that I know really well, and I go, oh, that's because I've done a self tape for this. Whereas once when I was like, I've done a self tape and I get myself worked up, and have you heard anything to my agent? All that shit. Yeah. I just don't do that. I literally forget <laughs> I forget what I've done in a day and I'm really bad at communicating because I go oh you know I'm doing the podcast with Michelle today I'll communicate today because I'm just like I can't I've, I, that's how I've had to learn because the anxiety levels of waiting for scan results and blood tests and the analysis of the mastectomy and all this you know I lost you know I've had a boob off ovaries off lost all my okay. hair I've I've I was fucked do you see what I mean and when you've done that gone really telling about you you can't ha you have to have a priority shift because that feeling in the same way we're talking about externalizing our worth from other people that feeling of externalizing my life and my power to these doctor letters and hospital letters and phone calls and you know you know it's the hospital because it's a withheld number the the fucking anxiety i can't even tell you the pitch of anxiety i was at that point i thought i can't live like this i'd, I'd rather I'd, what's the point of living if mm -hmm. i'm going to be like this so I just had to go, I've only got today. And tomorrow's not promised to anyone. And, and you know, oh yeah, you could get it by a bus tomorrow. And you think, shut up, fuck off, die. But I, I can't I can't help but be fundamentally changed by that. And and if you just go, oh, I'm doing my best work today. I really enjoy, uh, this is my this is my day. Most, I've been writing this morning and this afternoon and it's lovely. Like, so I just go, whatever. I can't, I'm not in control of how this might get clipped or if it go this right now and mm. it goes viral and people go, want to slag me off or <laughs> say that or slag us off. You know, I'm not in control of that. I know what I'm enjoying it today. And then that has somehow <laughs> paradoxically been a really good career plan. And I genuinely think so many things that happened whilst I was putting my wig on and painting my lashes on happened because it weren't manifestation. It was more just like an Oprah kind of gratitude kind of living in the moment gratitude fullness that somehow my vibration was higher that's it so in a way you're <laughs> a little grateful that you went through that yeah of course, okay of course. I mean, and i wasn't sure because I, I i i i wasn't sure with the cancer i was like i i, I didn't want to bring it up because i didn't know if it's one thing that you're like i get asked about all the time and yeah. i'm sick of talking about it you know what i mean but i'm glad that it kind of organically came up in the sense that not that you're grateful you had cancer but yeah. you're grateful for like what how it made you see life and think of like we only have today yeah and it sucks because it's one of those things that i think people will hear and be like that's right we do only have today but unless something like that happens to you it's really hard to change your mindset to mm. actually live your life like yeah that. but but you know so i could have been stuck in the neurosis that that was an option too i could have been stuck in the neurosis but i i couldn't it's almost like I, I thought I'm going to die of a heart attack before I die of cancer. My my anxiety was so high that I almost just said, I can't do this. And I th it was, it was an Oprah Winfrey post that, that she said, everyone asked me advice. If I only gave one bit of advice, if you only had to do one thing, it was a gratitude list. And I started doing it. And I <laughs> I don't continue it like as in a written form, but I think of that gratitude list as the rope that pulled me out of a dark well. <laughs> like I, it was like, I forced myself to be thankful and and she said something like, even if some days the only thing you can write is five, like, is breathe, <laughs> that I can breathe five. And some days there were really like, I can do that. And and I had to just find a way. And it was it was good, you know, and, and, and we, we were really like, you know, the circle, the wagons, we were, we, my circle came small. It was pretty much me, my husband, my mom, in that sense of like, we had to keep it small. Everything was delicate, everything, everything got stripped back do you know what i mean and even like the physicality of things like 
you know, your body it is it is still so recent. It's only two years. But I've just done like my Radio 4 special, which actually mm. became way more personal than I thought it would be. And actually it was really cathartic because oh, I've said it. I've said it on my terms. Uh, and, and it feels like, oh. Well, I didn't know that you were a cancer survivor until that. Oh, radio really? Yeah. Out. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't I put didn't it know. out. Yeah. I didn't put it out there because the truth is, it's going to sound really, I, I would have been doing it for attention. I don't think there's any. I think everything we do in this business cool. is for attention. Like, come on. Like, and I feel I don't want to do. So that. many of us are doing things for attention. Yeah. Whether it be like, oh, I have to have that ADHD diagnosis, or I yeah. have to have, because then we can talk about it. Yeah. And then it's something new to talk about. Opens us up to a different audience. But I, I, the fact that you realized that and admitted it is pretty fucking cool. Of course it is. And 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 so it could have been. A, I mean, when I first got diagnosed, you know, you're sending WhatsApps to people and letting them know, and that exhausted me. So mm-hmm. the idea that if I then everything's for the socials everything can then be projected can't it you know we're monitoring someone it would have been it would have been you know i posted a fucking thing the other day where someone has shaved their head so the husband shaves the head and i shared it to my story went boring and i got dms like you heartless fucking cunt this woman you know like an absolute abuse and i was like i didn't care and then i said yeah well i've just survived i've just had cancer so i've just gone through chemo so she's like doesn't fucking matter like she doubled down this bitch doubled I down love that. <laughs> good for her i guess <laughs> you know <laughs> and she you just special treatment yeah she went for me because i just thought i've obviously touched her nerve but even that like i just thought well you know i was fucking saucy i was going boring and and he, some people were more mild were like you do realize that someone with cancer that you've just said is boring but i thought Fuck it. Well, because it is. Because actually, everything's shtick, isn't it? Now, yeah, everything's fucking shtick. And if 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 fighting for your life can become, like, you know, everyone's gonna do a race for life. Hashtag kick cancer's ass. Get a hoodie with strong girls club. You know, the shave mm. the head. We all we've all fucking seen it. And you can't. I can say it because I'm a cancer survivor. But like, it's fucking shtick. It, it's fucking hack. Mm-hmm. Fuck off. <laughs> I'm bad. Like I. I'm one of those annoying people where I don't know what to say to somebody. Like I've, I've had, you know, I've lost a friend to cancer. I have another friend who's battling cancer right now. And I just don't talk about it unless they bring it up. Yeah. And I often feel guilty for that because when my friend who passed of cancer, when he was in the hospital, I was way too positive. And he yeah. finally had to say to me like, yeah, I'm going to die. Yeah. Like you can't. Cause I was like miracles. Ha-. And he was like, you can't. like, I yeah. need somebody. He was like, you can't come here unless you're going to be realistic and accept what this yeah, is. Yeah. And so I've carried that with me. Um, for a long time, and I do feel like I'm, I, I, I just don't know what to say to people, you know? So I always kind of, like, leave it up to them if they want to talk about it yeah. or what they want to talk about because I just – I. You hearing how annoying that was to him, how positive I was and saying things that weren't statistically going to happen <laughs> yeah. or weren't, you know, it made me feel – I guess a little gun shy in the sense that like yeah. I don't want to be that person again but I also don't want to be the opposite and be like so you might die what's that like <laughs> you know so it's like trying to find the balance of being like but uh, you can flip that all on its head and say what a good it's proof of what good friends you were that he go Michelle fucking reel it in I'm yeah. dying bitch and, yeah. you, and that you didn't go uh, you went oh, okay cool that's yeah. just that's just in the same way if you went no 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 I love the paint job you've done on the house and he's like it clearly looks like shit Michelle stop lying yeah it's the same deal do you, do you- I remember when he was in the hospital and there was one point like he was like uh let's go for a walk so we went for a walk and he was like just cigarettes and weed on you and I was like you have cancer and he was like I'm going to die yeah. let me get high and I was like okay uh, like yeah. I guess you know yeah so uh I mean he had a great attitude the whole way through and it's uh it's tough um, when people go through that, but I definitely saw a change in like his perspective on life too. Yeah. So I guess it really does change a person. Of course, because th- it's coming to us all. It's coming to us all. Like we, that we don't, none of us get out alive, and mm-hmm. and and most people have those moments. You know, I lost this, my sis, my older sister to cancer, mm-hmm. and she was so funny. She was a badass on like you know on you know six figures. She was like mother of three sons. She was so funny, and she was like she when she was. <laughs> In her last sort of few days, she was like, she said, I, d- I can't remember. It's so funny it coming out of her mouth because she went, I can't remember why I used to worry about stuff much. I was so worried about how my garden looked or how my house looked. She went, mm-hmm. I don't know why I never just knocked on my neighbor's door and go, excuse me, have you got a glass of wine? <laughs> Which is just so absurd. But you go, yeah, why not? Like, as in, uh, I've just written, I've just written a piece for, you know, a Sunday magazine. But, mm-hmm. and, but, in it I wrote that actually chemo wards are these amazing places where all that shit that we have that separates us has disappeared because everyone just we can meet, you're in it you know what I mean there's a real nice that shit that's that all that bullshit that we project mm-hmm. is gone and there's nothing that separates us and 
in a weird way, it was like I was really living when I was dying, like fighting. You know, you're really living, and I, hmm. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. Good that those insights. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know. I still don't know how long I've got. You know, it's so funny because um, I've got the gene because they tested the gene testing. So I've got the you know the Angelina Jolie <laughs> kind of. Oh, okay. And did you you didn't find that out till after you got diagnosed? Till after, okay. yeah. I did the gene testing about a year oh, ago. Oh, and okay. uh, I didn't have it. Oh, good. I mean, that doesn't. They make it very clear. This doesn't mean you're not going to get cancer. No. It just means that you're don't have the three that they've identified. Exactly, sort of right? Thing. Yeah. So I will have another mastectomy. And it was so funny, like, so they're really delicate with your language, but there was just this brilliant surgeon who was just so... And when I told a nurse what this surgeon had told me, they kind of laughed in that kind of way. Oh, God, shit, only her, sorry. But I liked it. She went, yeah. <laughs> she went, when I first met with her, because I just thought it was going to happen after my chemo, I was going to have the other resectomy. She went, no, we'll wait a couple of years because if you're going to die, it'll come back. You know, if you are going to die, it'll be in the next couple of years. So let's just wait. We won't give you unnecessary. And I went, oh, thanks. Actually, I kind of appreciate I kind that, of honestly. It. Yeah. Although, yeah, no one said that. No one has like actually given me a prognosis. It's a little bit like, we're just going to sit and wait. But I do have like blood tests and everything like that. But so I couldn't stay in this state of mm -hmm. fear I'm going to die. I've, I, I just said, uh, even when we went and got the first diagnosis, I said to my husband, because he's like, oh, it'll be fine. And my mum was like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be like, like you were, you know, with your friend. And I said, you know, I said to my husband, you know, like being positive is not about hoping I don't have it. It's about being cool if I do. Like we, that we being positive, like we got to be cool. Holy if, shit. Do you know? And he was That's like, brilliant. Okay, yeah. And, and, and he was like, okay, okay. And it was really funny when I went to get the diagnosis and um, it was, you know, you know, the consultants hour and a half delayed and we're like sitting there and, and I went to the desk and I said, look, I just I'm just here for some results like all cash you know like boss bitch edit. Like, I'm just here for some results so um you know uh can I not just see the cancer nurse like this and she, she went well you can but the whole team will want to see you and then I just I just turned to my husband and thought, that's how I knew that's mm. how I knew and I knew anyway because there's a real I've had a lump before when I was pregnant and it was like a blocked milk duct everything when you go and they you know you, I've always told people that they've got anything that they're worried about and go for scans or biopsies or whatever I was like even before you know, even before you know, you know, because I went for this to get it checked. I didn't take anyone. I just went and thought, fiddly dear, I've watched enough Doctor Pimple Popper. You know, it's probably yeah. a lipoma. Or I was like, I was so fiddly dear about it, and then went and it's like you just the whole energy changes. There's people there. There's stuff in the room. The whole thing changes, and I just was like. Oh, this is we're in a different. I take, oh, you know, I'm trying to get reception in the hospitals. Go get here now. You know wow. what I mean? Like, I you just know. You just I, say, I, I people say that, and I feel like I always think I know. <laughs> yeah. Like I had um a mammogram a few years ago after I got my implants. I had I had a lump, and it turned out to, to just be a harmless cyst. Yeah, but. Oh, I was convinced it was cancer. Oh, yeah, like in that moment, I was like, the way she's looking, like I, I know. <laughs> and I was like, you need to tell me. She's like, I, I can't tell you. And I was like, oh, okay. And she was like. It's fine. Yeah. I can't tell you it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. And I was like, okay. No, but from them, you know, right. you, you yeah, know, okay. I, I mean, from them, the right. whole, the whole fucking thing changes and you would get your results in like two and a half minutes. I'm probably going to, I might get backlash for asking this question. Go on. So you talked about you're going to have another mastectomy. Yeah. Do you think about getting new tits and what they're going to look like and no. doing something fun with them? Well, Is that, am, am I going to get in trouble for asking no, a cancer survivor I, that? I like questions. I, I like, like tits. That. Yeah. I like tits. Well, no, I, I, well, what they would have to do because it really annoys me because you know, like when someone's like transitioning and has top yep. surgery, it's so neat. And I don't know why I, I, there's probably a real medical answer and I should just Google it. I would love to have kind of had the top surgery that makes it look like I just have a really flat mm -hmm. low chest or something, but it's just, but because there's no, none there, what they would have to do, I under, as I understand, would have to be like a skin graft from my tummy, and oh, they're okay. kind of a bit mutiny. So they wouldn't be like I don't know. I've n I know a lot of women that have regretted the reconstruction because they're sort of a little bit Frankenstein, maybe. They're not like you have perfectly nice shaped boobs that then you're going to make bigger. They're interesting. Kind of, I never thought about yeah, that. Yeah. So it's. I'm not bothered to be honest. And Good for you. today I just went I went I went bra shopping today actually. And um I just had this moment where I'm sort of heaving myself in and I've got like a fake one mm -hmm. where I, I sort of said to my husband, I can't I can't I can't lie, I can't wait till I get <laughs> I was like this one, I get rid of it, I'm not bothered. Uh, but uh, that's just because a lot of vanity's gone. And it's not vanity. Uh, I don't I don't mean that in a shallow way. I'm just a little bit like 
Oh, you know what I mean? Like, you got other shit to worry yeah, about. Yeah, I've got other shit okay. to worry about. I appreciate know. you answering that and yeah. being like kind about me asking that because I was just curious, no. you know? Like, But my aunt in Canada, my aunt lives in Canada in Winnipeg, but she... Oh, God. Yeah, she lost... So cold there. Oh, no. <laughs> so she... Her husband made a joke with her because she had one boob off, then had a fake boob, and then... So she then had implants in both, and then uh, years, like decades, decades later, then she had another one. So then they... Then took that off, and then so then she had surgery, and then had other. He goes, "I'm the only man that's been married to one woman and had three secretaries." <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so, so maybe the surgeons are better in Canada. So she's done it and had good ones. So I don't know, but yeah, he. So yeah, there's there's options. I mean, I might, you know, I might be coming into your podcast in a couple of years and going, like, "Hello, tits. maybe you ain't heard." If you get <laughs> brand new tits, will you debut them on this podcast? Yeah, I will. That's a problem. I'm gonna hold there you to that. Yeah, That'd yeah, be amazing. Go. Um, I know we we got to wrap up soon. You you got a school run to do, probably. I oh, know. I think I might miss that, but who cares? But they know I'm the bad one. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> They're you have to send waiting email. in the rain in the playground. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of failures and rejections, um, I love the direction that we went, and I, I really appreciate you being so open and honest with that yeah. stuff. It, has there been anything in comedy that you've had a moment where you felt was a failure or a rejection oh, um, yeah. that maybe you look back on and you're like, that affected me or I didn't handle that properly? Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, I, um, I got a script commission from... A BBC fairly early on, and it mm -hmm. was everything was green light, green light, green light to the point of making a pilot, green light, green light, green light. And I was just sitting waiting for that to then be picked up and taken as a series. I've done that, and because it was going to happen, put all your eggs in one basket, all the eggs, mm -hmm. all the eggs in that basket. I can only imagine that's what feeling like getting jilted at the altar feels like. Or well, it's kind of like how you were talking, how you were with men too, right? Oh, yeah. It's the same thing where you're just waiting for that one thing. I accept you or not accept you. I'd written my BAFTA speech. It was so good. It's so <laughs> good. I just thought, like, oh my god, this is. I You're welcome so to do your BAFTA speech now. If no. You want. <laughs> no, but it was not a doubt in my mind. And when it didn't happen, I, 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 I was, I've, I can still, I, I can't even. I could, look, for three months, I could just be tearful about it. I can't even pick up the pieces. I'm so sure, and it was so good. Like. That was a real steep learning curve. That was because okay. lots of things in my comedy career have happened quickly and it's been green. Like, loads of lovely, exciting things. I haven't really... That, well, that knocked for me for I'm sitting here. Well, <laughs> then that, well, this was a biggie and it knocked me for six. And I mean, even like we saw it live, like, I didn't get it. I was told I didn't get it. And I was like, but it's fine because it's fine. And that is absolutely fine. Do you know what? Because it doesn't even what? matter. That probably doesn't it's matter. Fine. <laughs> you know, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. You know, I just, you know, I think it's pretty, no, you know. And then because someone pulled out, I did get it. And so my agent kind of tentatively was so convinced by me going, actually, you know what? Because it's fine. Because I don't, fuck, fuck, you know. And then finally, oh, I know you said that you didn't really want it, but would you do like, I was like, Okay, I'll find you back. I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such an idiot. Like, like I gotta pretend to be a little <laughs> yeah. shit about this. So yeah, I'm just an idiot. So fine. I love that. <laughs> so I, I okay. If you woke up tomorrow, your notifications were going crazy, and everyone was like, "Laura, what did you do?" Everyone hates you. <laughs> Is there something that comes to your mind where you're like, "That's probably what that would be"? Yeah, I think I think it would be speaking out of turn and gossiping and bitching mm. about something because because uh, we talked about I've talked about sisters. I, you, the thing when you have that, you can say, you can say such horrible shit about people. You can still love them. Like I would, I, if someone was gossiping to me about someone, unless I, they were saying something that was untrue or they were being harsh, I wouldn't be like, hey, hey, hey there, buddy. Stop that right there. I'd be like, tell me more. <laughs> like I, I think mean, gossip's healthy. We are. Yeah. Gossip's healthy. And also with comedians, there's no bottom line. You just want to say the funniest, darkest shit. 100%. Even if you don't yeah. fucking believe it. 100%. So, you know, there'll be screenshots of where you've just said some fucking dark fucking, just for the joke, just to do the top joke. Do you know what I mean? But I don't mean any of it. But if it, you know, if I had to read it in black and white or hear it, read and play, but I'm like, maybe hard oh. to your way out of. Oh yeah, maybe. Well, I, I didn't actually, you know, not obviously, you know, it's not funny, but it was funny it was at the funny. time. <laughs> yeah, I'm like that too. And I had a friend actually say to me recently, they were like, "You're a little too mean sometimes," because, and I'm like, "But I'm saying the funny thing. Like, if you set something up, <laughs> I'm gonna take that shot." And they were like, "You, you can't do that all the time." And it was another comic too. So I was like, what "The fuck is wrong with you? Like, you fucking hack loser, <laughs> right?" It's like we're supposed to be me. And my husband would get mad at me too because he was like, "You're so mean to me." I'm like, "It's." funny <laughs> yeah. and being funny and so i had to kind of take a step back and be like okay not everybody yeah. 
Because if somebody said something really mean about me, but it was really funny, yeah. I'd get over it. <laughs> I would get over yeah. it. But again, not everybody's like and, that. And yeah, and it doesn't really mean anything. And when I started in the school that I taught in, everyone was so mean about each other in the English department. Mm. And it was so funny, but... Then you'd find out they were like literally, oh, you know, oh, it's a collection for them. They loved each other to death. It never meant anything. It was surface. It was surface like, oh, roll of the eyes. Oh, she's fucking really pissed me off today. But we all did it. And, it, and I thought, oh, God, am I in a really toxic environment? I wasn't. I was in those women. Every single one of them would lie down in front of a bus for each other. Mm. Like, so it meant nothing. That was just how you get through the day going, oh, God, she didn't even tidy her classroom. Or she didn't, you know, it was all this, it just gets you through the day. It don't mean anything. So I can, I can kind of bitch and moan and vent and it don't really it's you so seem surface. like somebody though if somebody said i heard you said this about me you'd be like yeah oh uh, yeah you know? yeah there's yeah. no point in lying yeah I and think, i think yeah. I, i've been through that too where oh, I, i've forgotten my, like def- my I? default would have been to lie back in the day I <laughs> yeah been, I, 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 but now i'd be like yeah I said oh, it. sorry yeah. Meh. Yeah, you have to you get to yeah. get to that point because it's foolish sometimes you just forget you go did i or one of the worst things is, is so for instance if you were coming at me and you're like Oh, this person, rah, 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 you go, God, yeah, God, that really, what, what, wow, that sounds, what a bitch or something. But you've kind of loaded me up with stuff. I go, yeah. And then next thing you know, I heard you call me a bitch. And you're like, whoa, yeah. whoa I hate, that's some mean girls fucking. I actually, a few years shit. ago, I say a few years ago, it was probably a lot more than that. I'm, I'm getting up there. But I made a conscious decision to not tell people what somebody said about them because oh, I had people say that to me. And then somebody said, so, or I think I read something. I, I have a lot of self help books. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, they haven't helped, but I read them a lot. And one of them had said, it takes two people to hurt you the person that said something mean about you and the person that runs to tell you yeah. what they said so i i don't unless it's something crazy like yeah. unless you know my friend's husband said oh i'm gonna leave her tomorrow and I, i'm don't yeah, tell yeah, that yeah, fat yeah. bitch i'd probably yeah, tell them yeah, that yeah, yeah. i'd leave out the fat part but yeah, i would yeah. probably tell them that but so i made a really conscious decision to like not really do that anymore you don't need to and and you know it is that sort of i also think there's an unsaid code when you're like if you're in if you're doing that together then you, you're saying you're in the mm-hmm. circle of trust or what have mm-hmm. you. I mean, I, I've got the uh, a bit about bitchiness, but I think comics always do this bitch. When we're doing the bitchy feeler of whether you can bitch, you go, oh, yeah, how well do you know them? <laughs> and, you know, because, you know. What it, do you think of so and Yeah, like, oh, I've only gigged with them a couple of times. Like, okay, right. But yeah. because sometimes you can go right and they're like, yeah, it's my housemate. You're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, Where can people find you? You're on tour. I'm on tour. That's on the link in the bio. But yeah, just that Laura Smith. I mostly just share loads of nonsense. It's not and and it's a little bit of content. Yeah, I just I just keep. And you're very positive online in the sense that like, you when I post something, you'll be like, you look good or you look. I'm like, yeah, you are like, yeah. You're gonna be my new friend. My biggest revelation of this whole podcast. I mean, which is so. It's like you're so ridiculously beautiful. The very idea that you we were talking about watching ourselves back. She's like, oh, I can't because I'm conscious of how I look. I'm like. If you're fucking conscious of how you look, what hope is there for the rest of us? You're very beautiful. Thank you. It doesn't matter me saying it. You've got to feel it. And um, so just feel it. That's Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. This was like one of my favorite episodes. It was so Yay. organic. You were so open. Thank you. This Thank is you. Everybody Hates Laura Smith. <laughs> Yay. Everyone hates you.